Thanks everyone, delighted to be here and I don't know how I follow all the other speakers but I'll do my best and I'm also conscious that I'm the only thing standing between you and coffee so I will try and <laughs> speed on. So uh, as Fraser said, I am CEO of Friends at the End. Uh, I have taken over the mantle from uh, my esteemed colleague Amanda Ward. Uh, so just a bit quick plug about Friends at the End. We're a small but mighty charity. We promote public knowledge of end of life choices and campaign for assisted dying to be legalized. We empower people to have choice and dignity at the end of life within the current legal framework and we can help set up things like powers of attorney or advanced directives as well as offering a specialist counselling service for anyone affected by end of life issues. So please do consider joining us uh, as a member if you haven't already done so and make use of our services. So as Fraser said my own background is I started life as a doctor, uh, I've worked in the third sector and had a brief foray into the world of politics and it's mainly my experience as a doctor that I hope to bring to this presentation. Uh, to look at how assisted dying laws affect disabled people around the world. So, uh, just uh, so what I want to cover in this presentation is how an assisted dying law would affect people with disabilities in this country, why assisted dying laws do not disrespect disabled people, in fact, on the contrary, and what effect an assisted dying law would likely have on healthcare. So, let me start by setting the scene. This year, a lot's happened to make us feel optimistic about the very real chance of a significant expansion of our rights. Bills in both Holyrood and West Westminster are gathering momentum as popular support grows, and of course, of particular note, as I think Liam mentioned, the British Medical Association has taken a neutral stance on assisted dying where historically they've been opposed. Despite widespread popular support, opposition to assisted dying is as fierce as ever, but the arguments really haven't changed and the press tend to give a lot of air to some of these views with little space for rebuttal. So back to my first point, how would a law affect people with disabilities? Opponents often claim or imply that there's consensus among people with disabilities that assisted dying should be prohibited, and the opposition of disability rights organisation is often assumed, even in academic research, to be monolithic. But in reality, this image of unanimity is not borne out by the evidence. A recent survey of disability rights organisations in the UK indicated a wide diversity of opinions and policies on this issue. Of 140 organisations surveyed, a substantial majority remained silent or endorsed neutrality on assisted death. Only 4% explicit, explicitly oppose it. For those who remain neutral, Disability Rights UK's position is representative and they say, this is a complex issue on which people have different and passionate opinions. Disability Rights UK respects those different points of view. In many cases, the same reasoning will underpin many of those who are silent. If we move from considering disability rights organisations to the position of people with disabilities themselves, then the picture is more mixed. As Tom Shakespeare observes, Notwithstanding the blanket opposition of their organisations, people with disabilities in the United Kingdom do not oppose assisted dying with one voice. At a minimum, the views of the wider community are more mixed than the views of their leaders. In fact, polling suggests strong support for assisted dying laws amongst people with disabilities, albeit with concerns. Other studies have suggested that the level of support from people with disabilities for assisted dying laws is roughly the same as in the general population. A second common theme from the opposition is that the laws on assisted dying are disrespectful to people with disabilities. In fact, quite the opposite is true. The overgeneralization of disabled people as a whole shows disrespect and does not take serious, seriously the full spectrum of perspectives of people with disabilities. The line of thought that opposes assisted dying for reasons of disrespect to those with disabilities is incorrect in two respects. First of all, it misinterprets the core of the argument for assisted dying, which is not that some lives are less worth living than others, but that each individual must decide what makes her life worth living. The second mistake is to deny people with disabilities the right to exercise autonomy over their own life and death. We show respect for people with disabilities by recognising that they alone have the right to make decisions about their own lives and that nobody is in a position to judge that a disabled person's life is worth less worth living than someone else's. The best way forward for assisted dying activists, such as all of us here, is to engage with people with disabilities to see where they themselves see the risks and the problems, and then make a strong judgment about what those factors require. Do they actually undermine the case for assisted death, or are they better understood as a part of safeguard design? Opposition to assisted dying laws often centres on the idea that such laws are especially harmful to people with disabilities. 
that any attempt to safeguard will inevitably fail and that there will be a slippery slope from seemingly rigorous protections and safeguards to loose and harmful practices. As I think you've heard from uh, Amanda today, these speculations are weightless, but it's important not to downplay or dismiss the fears that underlie them. Those fears are real and understandable. They play a vital role in generating hypotheses to be tested against the evidence, both with a view to evaluating the proposed safeguards for assisted death laws and with a view to ensuring legitimacy and trust within the disabled community. However, these fears are not in themselves evidence that assisted dying laws disproportionately affect people with disabilities. And when the hypotheses they inspire are tested in empirical studies, the facts just do not confirm them. In no jurisdiction is there evidence that vulnerable patients have been receiving an assisted death at higher rates than the general population. And Amanda gave you more detail of that. The data just doesn't indicate abuse of these practices. A third argument commonly shared by opponents is that an assisted dying law would undermine health care for disabled people. There are two points to consider here. The impact of such laws on palliative care provision and the consequences for the doctor and patient relationship. The worry that assisted dying laws will undermine funding or support for palliative care is widely expressed. It features frequently in submissions from medical organisations when new legislation is proposed. In fact, the opposite is true. Assisted dying tends to go hand in hand with increased support for palliative care, both financial and otherwise. This is especially well documented in Belgium, where assisted dying is perceived as part of the palliative care continuum, and where legalisation was accompanied by better financial support for palliative care. In Oregon and the USA, dying people have been legally allowed assistance to die for over 20 years, and in that time, palliative care has significantly improved. When the law was reviewed after 10 years, the Oregon Death with Dignity Act was found to have improved end-of-life care among Oregon practitioners, including the increased use of hospice and palliative care. There is no tension between assisted death and a well-supported palliative care regime for those patients who do not seek to end their lives. The second worry related to access to healthcare for disabled people focuses on the relationship, relationship between patients and their healthcare practitioners. The fear is that assisted dying laws would undermine trust between patients and clinicians. As with all of the concerns I've mentioned today, these, these fears are sincere and grounded in concern for patients' well-being, including that of people with disabilities. Evidence from permissive jurisdictions is encouraging, however. The Netherlands reports the highest level of trust for doctors and the best communication between doctors and their patients concerning end-of-life decisions, and they have the most per permissive assisted dying laws in the world. In Oregon, doctors report that legalisation has helped doctors discuss all of a patient's concerns and requests, including the desire to die, thereby reducing the danger that patients feel abandoned and distressed at a great time of vulnerability. So around the world, the tide is changing. More and more countries are introducing legalisation to allow for legislation, sorry, to allow for assisted dying around the world, with Spain and New Zealand recently having passed their own laws this year. You've already heard in great detail about Liam MacArthur's pr proposed bill, so I won't repeat what has been said. But I will say again, however, um, and I would encourage you to take part in the process, participate, make your voice heard. The time is now to change the law precisely because we need to protect the most vulnerable, to give people in need reassurances that it's in their hands to say enough is enough and to not endure needless pain. Our laws and our healthcare must accommodate everybody and most people want to be able to choose their own path of dignity at the end of their lives and they deserve our compassion, our protection and our support. It's time we ask these questions openly and further the public debate amidst these discussions taking place in Parliament. All of us here hope to engage as many people as possible and help in raising their voices, but also engage opposition in a constructive way, addressing these and other misconceptions about future legislation on assisted dying, which is very much needed and long overdue. I truly believe that as former Justice Secretary David Gock eloquently put it, once reform has happened, people in the future will struggle to understand why some had previously objected. Thank you very much.